started. Uh, welcome to the SILAB seminar. Uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Osman Yagan, who is an assistant research professor of ECE and his appointment in Silicon Valley. Uh, prior to joining the ECE faculty, Osman was a postdoctoral fellow here, and prior to that, he got his PhD at uh, the University of Maryland. Um, in between, I think he was a visiting scholar at Arizona State University for about six months. Osman received his PhD at Maryland, as I just mentioned, and his BS degree in electrical and electronics engineering at the Technical University in Ankara mm -hmm. in Turkey. And his uh, research interests are in reliable and secure wireless sensor networks and, in general, communication networks and communication systems. Osman. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming here today. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about our recent work on secure and reliable design of wireless sensor networks. And this is joint work with Virgil Gligor, Farouk Yavuz, and Jun Zhou. So as the title suggests, we're going to talk about wireless sensor networks. So let's briefly introduce them first. For us, a wireless sensor network is nothing but a distributed collection of small sensor nodes that you bring together for a particular application. Apparently, the application areas are numerous. They range from uh, military applications to health applications to home automation to environmental monitoring. The key aspect that is motivating our study is that in most applications, sensors are small in size, they are low cost, and at the end of the day, they have very limited capabilities for communication and computation. On top of that, in various applications, sensors are deployed in hostile environments, and by hostile, we mean that there can be an adversary who monitors the communication, and who can even capture a number of sensors and use that to break down your network. Therefore, it is clear that we need cryptographic protection, and the solution that we come up with has to be scalable and has to have low storage management and computational requirements. So with this in mind, people actually discussed various solutions over the years to provide security to this type of environments. And it turns out that the most widely accepted solution, the most feasible solution, is using key pre-distribution and then using symmetric key encryption modes to secure sensor-to-sensor -sensor communication. So our work is also uh, is based on this idea of key pre-distribution. Let's talk about what this entails. The idea is actually very simple. Key pre-distribution means that before the deployment, assign each sensor a set of cryptographic keys. Let's call this the key ring of a particular sensor and denote it by sigma i. And the main idea here is very simple again. After the sensors are deployed, two of them can securely communicate as long as they have one key in common, as long as they share at least one key. The idea is, of course, if you and I share a key, we can use that key to encrypt and decrypt the messages uh, that we are going to exchange. So this is the basic idea of a key pre-distribution scheme. But the question here, the interesting question is, how do you generate and distribute these key rings? Let's say you have a sensor network with uh, size n. How do you generate and distribute sigma 1 up to sigma n? Before I motivate you towards the solution that we are considering, let me give you two trivial uh, methods to do that, and I will try to convince you that these trivial solutions will not work, actually. The first trivial solution is, of course, using a universal key, one cryptographic key to secure the whole network communication. That would work fine, uh, because each of us would have just one key in our uh, key rings, and that will be exactly the same key. The scheme will work fine until the point only one sensor is captured. The scheme provides no resiliency whatsoever against node capture attacks. Even if just one sensor is captured, uh, the whole network communication will be compromised. So if you want to move away from that extreme and uh, consider the second trivial solution, where you put a unique pairwise key between any pair of nodes. In other words, in this second trivial solution, each one of us will have n minus one keys in our memory, one separate key to be used to secure the communication with each of the other n minus one sensors. So in this case, security is pretty good. Uh, I mean, resiliency is pretty good. And actually, this solution has uh, the property of perfect resiliency, which means that if a sensor is captured, only the communication going through that sensor shall be compromised. No other part of the network shall be in danger. If you think about it, in the second solution, 
Let's say I am captured and the adversary has all the n minus keys uh, in my memory, but those keys can only be used in compromising the links that I was a part of. The adversary has absolutely no chance of capturing me and listening the communication between any two of you. So in terms of resiliency, we are fine here, but the problem here is about the keying sizes. For n large, each of us are keeping n minus one keys in our memory would be problematic because of memory constraints. And if you think about a dynamic environment where you need to manage this keying as well, let's say some sensors are captured, their keys are compromised, you have to revoke those keys, maybe more sensors are added in the system later on, you have to manage this keying, and if it is too large, it's gonna create a lot of management overhead as well. So due to these two reasons, excessive memory usage and management overhead, the second solution here is also deemed non-feasible. So people thought maybe something in between would work. Rather than giving each sensor only one key or giving n minus one pairwise keys, maybe we should do something in between. And that's how this idea of random key predistribution came to existence. So our work, when we say that we're gonna design a secure and reliable wireless sensor network, what we really mean is we are considering a wireless sensor network that operates under one of the random key predistribution schemes. And then we will talk about how we can uh, design this in a, in a reliable manner. So let's talk about what this uh, idea is about. The idea is actually not too difficult to understand. Uh, by the name suggest, uh, as the name suggests here, the only difference between the traditional key predistribution is that the key rings here, the set of keys that you're gonna put on each sensor, is now generated by a random process. You have a large set of cryptographic keys known as the key pool, and then each key ring, each sigma i, is gonna be generated uh, from this key pool in a random fashion. The main idea stays the same, but let's dig into it a little bit more here. Once the sensors are deployed, we are saying that two of them can establish a secure communication link as long as both conditions here are satisfied simultaneously. The first condition is very intuitive. We are saying that the two sensors should have a wireless communication link in between. So what does this mean? It, of course, needs to be made precise, but let's consider two wireless communication model, uh, models. One, will, one example will be the disk communication model, where two sensors have a wireless link as long as the distance between them is less than a particular threshold. If you want to use a more complicated model, you can use what is known as the SANR graph model, where the constraint for the existence of a wireless link is that the signal to noise plus interference ratio over that link is uh, above a certain threshold. But for now, let's not focus on the particular wireless communication model, but let's just assume uh, that we are enforcing this first constraint here. The second condition is more interesting to us. It is related to security. We are again asking for two sensors to establish a secure link. Uh, we are asking again that they should have at least one key in common. In other words, their key rings should have an unempty intersection so that they can use the common key to, to secure their communication over this existing wireless link. So with this basic idea, people have started proposing one random key predistribution scheme after another. I don't know the exact count here, but I believe there are about 50 different uh, solutions which can be taught about under this uh, basic umbrella. But in this line of work, we are only focusing on two specific key predis random key predistribution schemes. The first one is uh, called the hnr gligor scheme, and the second one is the random pairwise key predistribution scheme proposed by Chan, Perig, and Song. So as you look at the proposers of these schemes, you will see that our choices are pretty unbiased. Of course, uh, that's sort of a joke because both schemes are invented by people who are somehow related to Carnegie Mellon University, but of course, that's not why we picked them. The first scheme here, the hnr gligor scheme, is essentially the very first scheme in the literature. It is the pioneering work in this field. And it's, I believe, one of the most intuitive solutions. And the second one, the pairwise scheme, uh, proposed by Chan, Perig, and Song, is a, has a very interesting construction, which I will talk about in a moment, and it has some nice advantages. So that's pretty much why uh, we picked these two. So let's move on and introduce their construction, and let's start with the hnr gligor scheme here. So 
The idea is actually not so difficult to understand. Uh, we have n nodes, we have a key pool of size p. The constraint here is that each key ring should have size exactly k, and those k keys will be uniformly selected, will be selected uniformly at random from this key pool. In other words, the n key rings, sigma 1 up to sigma n, will be independent from each other. They will be identically distributed, and in fact, they will be uniformly selected from this key pool such that each has size k. So one quantity that you may be interested in at this moment is what are the odds that you and I are sharing a key. So let's say you grabbed k keys from a key pool, I did the same. What are the chances that we have at least one key in common? I'm not going to the detail, but it is given by this quantity, which here, uh, from here onwards, will be denoted by 1 minus q theta. And to put more context here, in certain parameter regimes, k squared over p is a very good approximation for that. So at this very moment, I would like to hint at some questions that you might be asking about this particular scheme or any random key predistribution that is out there. Given the randomness involved, so each of us are grabbing k keys out of a key pool of size p. This is done randomly. And we are asking two of us to share at least one in common before we can communicate securely. Given this randomness involved, how can you ensure that you have a connected network? In other words, a network where a secure communication path exists between any pair of nodes. How do you ensure that? And if you can answer that, the next step will be about reliability. So you get connected, but what happens if a number of sensors or links just happen to fail? So these are the type of questions that we will be asking and hopefully answering. Let's now move on to the construction of the pairwise scheme which is interesting, which actually starts by each sensor picking k other sensors, uniformly at random, and now we say that two sensors are paired to each other if at least one of them selects the other one. So let's say we are the sensor network, I'm gonna pick k individuals out of you in a totally random fashion, you will do the same, and we're gonna say that you and I are paired if either I select you or you select me or both happens. And then for each such pair, let's say you and I were paired, we pick a key from the key pool, append our IDs in front of that, and insert that key exclusively in the memory of you and I. In other words, in this pairwise scheme, each key will be exclusively stored in the uh, memories of two sensors, and it can, it's, it's going to be used solely in securing the communication over that particular link. So because of this unique feature, the pairwise scheme has some advantages. The first one that you can already realize is perfect resiliency. Again, in this scheme, because each key is exclusive to a particular pair of nodes, if, let's say, I am captured, the keys that I have can only be used in compromising the links that I was a part of. The adversary, again, has no chance of capturing me and compromising the link between any two of you. So perfect resiliency comes for free. The second advantage is not to note authentication, which means that whenever you receive a message encrypted by a particular key, you exactly know who is sending you that particular message. And not to note authentication can be important in hostile situations, let's say when you want to detect those nodes which are captured. So I think by now we have enough, advan uh, enough motivation uh, to consider secure. Yes, go ahead, please. Well, rather than each sensor is being paired to n minus 1, we have this k here. And k can be much, much less than n minus 1. And then you still get a pretty reasonable network, something that's connected and reliable. So that's sort of the advantage. Yeah, so you need, so you do this pairing thing. I pick k out of you, you do the same. And then we are said to be paired if I select you or you select me or both. Otherwise, we will not be paired and we won't be storing a key for that. So on average in this scheme, each sensor will keep two K keys rather than N minus one. And K can be much, much less than N. So we have enough, you had a question? OK, so we have enough motivation to consider secure wireless sensor networks under either the hnr Gligor scheme or the pairwise scheme. Again, the questions that we are uh, trying to answer here is that given the randomness involved, 
In the pairwise scheme, randomness is involved in the pairing mechanism. I pick K randomly and you do the same. How do you ensure really the network at the end of the day you get is connected and has some sort of reliability? So with these two questions already in mind, here we present a research agenda which we have been uh, you know, following for a number of years now. The first basic question is, again, how do you ensure that you get connected, and if you do it for the HNR, Gligor, and pairwise schemes, maybe you can compare them. So that's the basic first question of this research agenda. The second question starts with realizing the fact that your answer to the first one can depend on the particular wireless communication model that you are using. In other words, if you move from the disk communication model, let's say, to the SANR graph model, the parameter choices that give you connected network may be different, and understanding how this uh, wireless communication model affects those parameter choices is of great interest. I can say that the first two questions here have received relatively well attention thus far, but not the third one. The third one now raises the question about the reliability of your network. Let's say you get answers to the first two of them. You can uh, design connected networks, but what happens if 10 of your sensors and 15 of your links just happen to fail? And we know that sensors fail for various reasons. They can be captured by the adversary, they can run out of battery, they can just fail because of product malfunctioning. And in an environmental application, maybe animals just crash them or eat them. So all sort of things can happen. And wireless links, we know, just fail because of excessive noise or interference or because of harsh environmental conditions. So we have enough motivation to study reliability and we know reliability is crucial, particularly crucial in uh, the applications that I list here. Let's think about military. You deploy the sensors in a battlefield. You expect some of your sensors to be captured by the adversary and you don't want your network to become unconnected, disconnected, let's say, if adversary captures only a few sensors. You need some sort of reliability here. Environmental monitoring, you deploy to a field. Sensors are going to stay unattended for long periods of time. Some of them will die uh, because of battery drainage. So you don't want your network just to become disconnected if a number of sensors happen to run out of battery. Health applications, of course, they are life critical. You don't want your patient's life to hinge on, uh, let's say, the failure of a few, few sensors. So reliability is crucial and it's relevant, and that's what we are doing. We are trying to derive design, guide, design guidelines so that these secure wireless sensor networks we have are reliably connected. And we are doing this using a very useful and very interesting metric known as K-connectivity, which basically means that your network remains connected even if any K-1 nodes or any K-1 links happen to fail. So it gives you an understanding as to how reliable your network really is. So if, it is, if your network is 20 connected, you understand that you can sustain the failure of any 19 sensors or any 19 links. But K-connectivity does a lot more than that. It has some very nice advantages, which makes it even more interesting and more important. The first advantage of the K-connectivity property is about efficient routing, which means that by Menger's theorem, we know that if you are K-connected, then between any two nodes, there exists at least K mutually disjoint paths connecting them. In other words, if you and I belong to a K-connected network, I have at least K mutually independent paths that I can use to communicate with you and vice versa. And that can be useful in efficient routing, efficient load balancing. And let's think of one example where I need to send you a very urgent message that I really transmit, deliver to you. I can send the same message over all each of these K parallel channels, and I can hope with high probability that in one of, at least one of these channels, my transmission is successful so that I can deliver you the urgent message that I wanted to deliver. So not only K-connectivity gives you a level of reliability, it allows you to have efficient routing, load balancing, and robust delivery of urgent messages. So the second one here, second benefit, is also particularly interesting. It is about robust decision-making or achieving consensus. So let's give one example where uh, you deploy the sensors in a battlefield. You give the task, give a task to them to detect whether or not your adversary is onto something. 
Maybe adversary is changing its position. But you know that some of your sensors may be adversary controlled. We know that your network can still give the correct decision if, or reach a consensus if it is 2M plus 1 connected and the number of adversary controlled nodes is less than or equal to M. So another benefit of K connectivity is uh, that it allows you to achieve consensus or give robust uh, decisions. I think the first two are pretty important, but the third one is particularly interesting. It is about mobile sensor networks, an emerging application. But we know that mobile connectivity is very hard to achieve. But K connectivity can already give you some leverage here. If you are K connected, you can basically assign any K minus one of your sensors as mobile agents. They can roam around anywhere in the network without affecting your connectivity. So if you have an application where not all of your nodes need to be mobile, but you are fine with having only a bunch of mobile agents, then K connectivity can give you the much needed uh, mobile connectivity. So summing up, K connectivity tells you how reliable your network is and it has these nice additional benefits. So no one can really stop us from working on the K connectivity of secure wireless sensor networks. So we now know what we're gonna do we don't know, uh, I haven't told you yet how we are doing it. We are using random graph modeling uh, to answer those questions. And don't let this name intimidate you if you don't know what it is. A random graph is just a graph by uh, with, which has, a, let's say, a bunch of vertices and some vertices having edges in between. It's called a random graph when those edges are assigned according to a random process. And when I say random graph modeling, what I mean is that I am representing a secure wireless sensor network. In other words, a wireless sensor network that operates either under the HNR Gligor or the pairwise scheme by an appropriate random graph model. And in this case, the appropriate random graph model is going to be an intersection of two different structures, which are themselves random graphs in this case. So you may ask, why do you need two, uh, two structures and why do you take the intersection? The answer actually was given a while ago uh, where we have actually agreed on putting two constraints for the existence of a secure link between any two sensors. The first constraint here, which is about wireless communication links, is going to induce a wireless communication graph where two nodes have an edge as long as uh, they can, in principle, talk to each other, not necessarily in a secure fashion. And if you are using the so-called disk communication model, it means that two nodes will have an edge as long as their distance is less than the transmission radius of the sensors, let's say. The second constraint, which was about security, is going to induce another structure, which, is, which we call as the key graph, where two nodes will have an edge as long as they share at least one key. Now, since we need both conditions to be satisfied simultaneously, we create a system model by taking the intersection of the communication and key graphs such that we now have an edge between two nodes as long as both conditions are satisfied. Uh, the sensors have a common key and they have a wireless link available to them. So the links in the system model are representing pairs of sensors which can securely communicate with each other. So this is exactly the system model that you want to look at, and this is exactly the model that you want to establish the K connectivity of. So when I move on, I will specify two different key graph models, one induced by the Schenar gligor scheme, the second one induced by the pairwise scheme, and then I will define a communication graph which is going to be used in both cases, and then we will go ahead and take this intersection and create two system models, and then I will start presenting the results for their K connectivity. So far, so good. Let's start with specific key graph models, start with the HNR Gligor scheme, which induces what we naturally call an EG graph, denoted by K and theta, and being the number of nodes, and theta is just uh, shrinking these two parameters together. If you remember, K is the number of keys that you are putting on each sensor, P is the key pool size. The construction is exactly the same. I'm just formally defining uh, the random graph here. We have N vertices, each of them are assigned uh, a key ring, which is selected uniformly at random from this key pool such that it has size K. So the edge set of this graph consists of pairs I and J uh, such that they have at least one key in common. 
Again, the probability of an edge is given by the probability that u and i share a key. It is, of course, still uh, given by 1 minus q theta or roughly by k square over p. So the EG scheme induces the EG graph. So what does the pairwise scheme do? It induces what is uh, actually commonly known as a random k out graph. It's a well-known structure in the literature on random graphs. It is denoted by h and k. It's just exactly the uh, construction of the pairwise scheme. Nothing is different here. We have n vertices again. Uh, each vertex is selecting k other vertices uniformly at random, and then we put an edge between two nodes if uh, I is in the I was selected J selected by J or J was selected by R. This is a logical or so uh, we put an edge of course when both of these events simultaneously take place as well. The link probability in this case, the chances that at least one of us selecting the other is given by this quantity. Uh, just to give you a little bit more context here, it's going to appear uh, in some of the results we're going to present. So thus far, I have presented two different key graph models. Now it is time to talk about the communication graph. In this line of work, we have picked a very simple communication model. We discarded this communication model or the SANR graph model and used the simple communication model known as the on-off fading channel which says that between any two nodes, there is a wireless link available with probability p, or there is no wireless link available with a probability 1 minus p, and all wireless channels are independent across the network. This can easily be represented by a classical Erdosian graph, denoted often by g and p. It's exactly the same thing that I just defined. g and p is n nodes between any two nodes. You flip a coin, draw an edge with probability p, or do not draw the edge with probability 1 minus p, and do that independently across all pairs of nodes in the graph. So before I move on and take the intersections, I want to make one comment here. Although this model is very, very simplistic, in simulations it appears that it is almost a perfect approximation to the well-known or more popular disk communication model. In the disk communication model, we are deploying the sensors uh, randomly to a field and ask two of them to be close enough before they can communicate. And it turns out that this simple communication model uh, for the properties that we are interested in uh, almost perfectly approximates the disk model. So although it is simplistic, we shouldn't think uh, too less of it. So what did we do? We design, in, introduced two different key graph models and we already specified our communication graph. Now it is time to take the intersections and uh, look at the system models we have. The first system model I have is going to be representing a wireless sensor network that is operating under the shnr Gligor key predistribution scheme. So it is going to be a secure wireless sensor network. The representation is going to be done by the intersection of the EG graph and an Erdosheni or an ER graph. The second system model is going to represent a wireless sensor network, again secure because it is going to use the pairwise key predistribution scheme. This time, uh, the representation is going to be done by taking the intersection of the k out graph, which was the key graph of the pairwise scheme, and again, the same communication graph, Erdosian graph, that we are using. So I, our main goal is, of course, again, to derive conditions such that both of these models are k-connected with high probability. So let's switch to the main results and start for the results that concern the k-connectivity under the hnr gligor key predistribution scheme. The question that I'm really trying to answer is stated here. Let's say I am a network designer, a customer approaches me and says that he needs a secure wireless sensor network, and he asks me that uh, to use the HNR Gligor scheme as the, as the security solution. I say fine. And then he says that he needs a network which can sustain the failures of any to any nodes or any to any links. I say fine. I will give you a 21 connected network and that will do the job for you. Or in another example, let's say someone has the mobile sensor network application in mind, comes to me and says that. I need a secure sensor network, but I want to have at least 15 uh, sensors that are mobile, as mobile agents. I say, fine, I will give you a 16 connected network, and it will get the job done. The question is, once this performance metric is specified, how can I decide on these two parameters? 
number of keys that I am going to put on each sensor and the key pool size, such that for a given uh, probability little p that a wireless channel is on, that is something you may need to estimate as well, and for a given network size n, so that my network that is representing the wireless sensor network is k-connected with high probability. More specifically, I will try to establish conditions such that this probability of k-connectivity approaches to 1 or 0 as n gets large. And the reason why I want to establish such a 0-1 law is that I want to know exactly how the transition from not having that property to having it almost surely takes place. I want to establish the exact threshold so that I don't overshoot and lose from other things. May not be clear here, we can discuss later, but your connectivity and reliability is at odds with the memory and management complexity, and as well as in some cases with the resiliency of your network. So if someone asks you a specific level of reliability, you, don't, you shouldn't give more, you, don't, you shouldn't overshoot, because if you do so, you will lose from excessive memory or management complexity or uh, your network being less resilient. So establishing the exact threshold is particularly important. So let's look at the answer we have given to this. So here is our, uh, one of our main results, which is a very strong uh, zero one law, which is unfortunately not uh, very easy to uh, digest probably. Here is a more friendly version of it. <clears throat> I have rewritten this so that it is in this form, and here I have the average node degree. So the degree of a node is the number of links incident on that. It's the average number of connections that each one of us are having. And the result here says that if you're, in terms of the average node degree in the network, the threshold of k connectivity is exactly given by log n plus k minus 1 log log n. And if average node degree is written as threshold plus the deviation function, which is denoted by gamma, if you are above the threshold by an unbounded amount, in other words, if gamma n goes to plus infinity, then almost surely you will get k connected. But if you are below the threshold by an unbounded amount again, in other words, if gamma n goes to minus infinity, then your, your network will almost surely be not k connected. So this is the uh, main result, which is specifying the threshold of k connectivity. Let's look at what it means for practical uh, purposes. So I'm going to present a bunch of uh, simulation results. In each case, the network size is set to 2,000. So you have a sensor network with 2,000 nodes. And the key pool size is set to be 10,000. And here, I am showing the empirical probability of being k connected as a function of k. So this guy here is the number of keys that you are giving to each sensor. So in both cases, it is the same. And this is drawn for various uh, wireless channel probabilities, p. So one, I have two comments here. The first one is that the vertical dashed lines giving you the threshold of uh, k connectivity prescribed by our analytical result. So in all of these cases, you see that the vertical threshold, the vertical dashed line prescribed by our result approximates very well the real threshold of being uh, K connected, in other words, achieving the certain level of reliability you want it. So in all cases, we see the same behavior. Uh, if you want to look at a specific example, let's look at this one here. I am saying that the threshold of being too connected is giving 16 keys to each sensor. If you put too less, if you give 14, you get zero chance of being too connected. If you put two more, if you give 18, the chances of being too connected increases suddenly to 92%. If you give three or four more, suddenly you get almost surely to connect it. So the threshold is well approximated by the analytical result we have. The second comment is about the particular trade-offs that you can understand from these plots or our result. The trade-offs between the number of keys that you are putting on each sensor versus the reliability that you are getting. So let's look at this one, right? Uh, if you put 22 keys for each sensor, you get uh, four connected, so your network can sustain the failure of three nodes or three links, or in the mobile application, you can have three mobile sensors. But suddenly, if you put 28 rather than 22, six more keys per sensor can get you 10 connected. 
So rather than sustaining the failure of three nodes, you can now sustain the failure of nine nodes. Or rather than having three mobile nodes, you can have nine mobile sensors. So is it a trade-off well, well, well worth of exercising? That's not my job to decide. It's the job of the network owner. But the point, the punchline here is that such trade-offs are pretty evident from the result we have established. And it's given here. In order to increase the level of reliability by one, which means increasing k by one, you have to increase the average degree by log log n. And you know how average degree is related to your network parameters. How you can increase the average node degree by log log n is already evident uh, from the calculations that you can make. And here you can clearly see the trade-off. What kind of things you can do to increase the reliability of your network or what kind of parameter changes you should do in order to, let's say, increase the number of mobile agents in your uh, network is already evident uh, from, from this result, which prescribes the exact threshold of K connectivity. So at this point, we can ask, are we done here? So is this story complete with the zero one nodes we have established? If you think about it, the results thus far we have established can already tell you when the chances of being K-connected is zero, or it is one. It doesn't tell you anything about in between. More precisely, it doesn't tell you anything about when the deviation function is bounded. It doesn't go to minus or plus infinity, but let's say it goes to something uh, bounded. So here is the result. The only thing we know is when the average node degree is bounced against the threshold plus the deviation, and the only thing we know is when it goes to minus or plus infinity. What if it is 10 or 5 or minus 20? We don't know anything about it. And we wanted to fill that gap so that we have a complete picture. And one motivation to do that was, let's think of an example where the customer comes to you and says that he needs a 10 connected network for sure. But he's also interested in, let's say, at the odds of surviving the failure of any 15 nodes. So you want a certain level of reliability, guaranteed, but you are also interested in, let's say, your chances of surviving a larger uh, failure size or a larger, uh, or the chances of having a larger number of, let's say, uh, mobile nodes. So with this motivation, we worked uh, more, let's say, and got the result which we are pretty happy about. It's about the asymptotically exact probability of K connectivity. Now, when the average node degree is again written as the threshold plus the deviation, the deviation now doesn't need to go to plus or minus infinity. It can go to any constant. Then the exact probability, asymptotically exact probability of being K-connected is given by this nice expression, nice double exponential form. And what does this tell you for practical purposes? Here is a plot which is showing three pairs of figures. One uh, in each pair, one is the simulation, the other one is the analysis. And we are seeing almost a perfect match between the analytical probability that we are es uh, estimating from our analytical results, analytical probability of K-connectivity versus the uh, reality. What is really happening on average in your numerical simulations. If you think about it, this is pretty strong because you don't ever need to run any simulations anymore. Tell me the parameter choices that you have in mind. I can plug this into my equation and can tell you the exact probability, exact chances that you have a certain level of reliability that you want. So now I think the picture is complete and we thought it is now time to move to the pairwise scheme. So now we're going to look at the corresponding results uh, for the pairwise key redistribution scheme. We just started this line of work, and we don't yet have as complete results as we do have in the uh, previous case. Again, the question that I am willing to answer is just similar. Given a performance metric, the level of uh, reliability that someone desires, I'll try to find conditions on the scheme parameter k. In the pairwise scheme, if you remember, k is the number of selections that each of us are making. Once this uh, performance metric is specified, my job is to select this so that the pairwise scheme, the network I have, is k connected with high probability. Of course, I want to establish the same type of 0, 1 node so that I get the uh, exact threshold. But we haven't completed this work yet. So we don't have the 
uh, 0, 1, no yet, but we have a very nice partial result, which is for the weaker property that everyone in the network has at least k connections. So rather than k connectivity, we looked at the property that minimum node degree in the graph is at least k. And the result here has now this form, which is looking pretty similar. On the right, we again have uh, the traditional threshold, log n plus k minus 1 log log n, gamma n being the deviation, we still have the same type of 0, 1 low. But on the left, we have something that's not quite the average degree now. That's something different. And we will talk about how this is related now to the average degree of the uh, sensor network under the pairwise scheme. But the result, again, says that in terms of this function here now, the threshold is given by log n plus k minus 1 log log n. If you are above the threshold, that almost surely everyone in the network will have at least k connections. But if you are below the threshold, then almost surely you will have at least one node with degree less than or equal to k minus 1. So let's look at how uh, this is related to the previous results and consider how this guy here that is appearing in the theorem is are uh, related to the average node degree. We know by a simple calculation that average node degree in this graph, uh, which is uh, representing a sensor network under the pairwise scheme, is given by this quantity here. And big surprise, if p goes to zero, if the probability that a wireless channel is on goes to zero, then this quantity is actually going to be uh, asymptotically equal to the average node degree. So under this parameter regime where p goes to zero, the results are exactly analogous with the classical results and the, with, with the results concerning the shenar gligor scheme. And if you think about it, p going to zero is not such a bad assumption, or it's not too far away from uh, practicality. If you think about it, if let's say this is the room that we are deploying the sensors to, if you deploy more and more sensors, which means n is getting to infinity to this very uh, limited region, you expect that at some point the chances that two people have a wireless link available is going to diminish due to excessive interference. If you deploy gazillion sensors to a limited area, you don't expect too many of them uh, to be able to communicate with each other. So under reasonable conditions, the result look pretty similar to the previous case. But in general, we know because of this fact that the quantity here is always larger than the average node degree. So what this means is pretty interesting, actually. You end up comparing something larger than the average degree, in this case, to the same threshold. The conclusion that you can draw is that the property of ensuring everyone having at least k connections is something that you can achieve more easily in the pairwise case than as compared to the shnr gligor case. Because even with a smaller average degree, since you are comparing something larger than the average degree, you can still exceed the threshold and get this property ensured. So one important conclusion here is that, let's say you have two wireless sensor networks. One is operating under the pairwise. The other one is operating under the shnr gligor case, uh, shnr gligor scheme, let's say. And let's say you want to compare these two sensor networks. And a fair matching condition would be to match the total number of links in these two networks. So if you want to have a fair comparison, you should have a matching point. And let's say you match them through the uh, average node degree or total number of uh, links in the network. The result here is telling you that the one with the pairwise scheme is going to be more reliable than the one with the shnr gligor scheme. So that's sort of the punchline here. But of course, this work is not complete yet. We have to move towards the k-connectivity property. And one good news is that k-connectivity is something strongly, uh, strictly stronger than minimum node degree being at this k. What this means is that the result that we have established, which here says that if under this condition, you will have at least one node with degree less than k minus 1, or strictly less than k, let's say. In that case, your network will automatically will be not k-connected. Therefore, the zero law that we wanted to establish here is already given by the result I have presented. The only thing I need to do to complete this work is to establish the one law part, or the scaling conditions that lead to k-connectivity almost surely. And we have another good news from the literature, 
We know by the literature on Erdős-Rényi random geometric or random key graphs, various versions of random key graphs, that whenever the minimal node degree is larger than k, you get k connected. So the two properties are essentially asymptotically equivalent to each other. If you have one, you get the other. If you don't have one, you don't get the other. The two properties, minimal node degree being at this k and k connectivity, are asymptotically equivalent in most uh, cases in the literature. And we are confident in this case as well, it's going to be the same. And the only thing that we need to do to establish the one law is to show that probability of being not k connected although everyone has k connections, is a diminishing probability. And once we do that, uh, we will get the 0, 1 law we wanted, which is stated here as a conjecture. Everything's staying the same. Now I am saying that the same 0, 1 law will uh, hold true for k connectivity. And there is good numerical support for that, which is going to end my talk, actually. So on the left, we are showing the probability of having everyone at these two connections. On the right, we see the probability of being two connected for various parameter regimes. And you are seeing that the figures are almost indistinguishable, which indicates that in this case as well, the two properties, having at least uh, a number of connections in the network and having that level of connectivity, turns out to be uh, almost equal to each other, which supports our uh, which supports the validity of our conjecture, which uh, is the point where I would like to stop, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Um, so, I have a question about the abstractions that you use. I okay. Mean, basically, uh, you use mathematical abstractions here mm -hmm. uh, to model uh, security and reliability, communication reliability in sensor networks. Yeah. But the question is, uh, do those mathematical abstractions uh, have applicability in other fields than in sensor networks. In other words, that's a great. What, what, what happens is, you when you build an abstraction, mm -hmm. that's the benefit of it. Yeah, you'd like to see the benefit in all possible yeah. areas. So that's a great point, actually. I, Do you think? Yeah, I could have given another presentation uh, with the same results, but with totally different uh, applications in mind. The good part of abstracting these things is that you can now apply to other things. If you think about it, this K and theta model, right? It is saying that every node in the network has k objects which are selected uniformly at, at random from an object pool, let's say of size p, and two people have an edge as long as they have one object in common. People thought this may, might be useful to model social networks. So if you have k uh, interests, k hobbies, let's say, you go to uh, play golf, you watch basketball games, and I have other different set of hobbies. If you and I have a cubby, hobby in common, then it is likely that we will be friends to each other. So that's one thing that people used for uh, modeling social networks, actually, this graph itself. H and K model, on the other hand, I didn't have time to uh, dig into this further. So if you remember the construction, each of us are selecting k other nodes uniformly at random, and then we say we have an edge between two nodes if at least one selects the other. We showed in a different result that this graph itself gets connected very easily. Even if everyone just selects two other people uniformly at random, everyone be doing the same, we will get a connected network with very high probability. That already tells you a very easy way to establish a connected network. Let's say we get together, 100 of us, and let's say we want to establish a connected structure. How do we do it? This is one way to do it. If you let each people pick two other people uniformly at random, let's say you add two people at random as a friend in a social network, the result, another result we have established, shows you that the, at the end of the you know, connections, the resulting network will be connected with probability uh, almost one, actually. And this is true. Not necessarily when n gets large, even with 50 nodes, we show that probability of connectivity will be, if I remember correctly, larger than 99.9%. So the abstractions, the beauty here is that you can use them for applications that you can think of now. Maybe there will be applications 10, 20, or more years later on. So that's something uh, 
to keep in mind maybe some of the results may see other applications in the future and if you have a par particular problem which you can uh, fit into one of the abstract models we have presented here, you can let us know and we can uh, maybe discuss about it as well. Yep. You mentioned that one of the advantages of a K network uh, was that you could have K minus one uh, mobile nodes, if I recall. Yes. And I was trying to understand what you meant by that. It's, I assumed that you meant that, you could, that mobile nodes somehow could disappear because they walk away, um, and therefore you could lose K minus one of them. But why would that be any different than K minus one of them being eaten by deer? Yeah, exactly. All it meant is that you could lose K minus one of them is what is mobile ones, whereas you assume you wouldn't lose stationary ones. Oh, so it's sort of a trade-off here. So if you have K minus one mobile nodes, only one connectivity is, is guaranteed. You cannot have both mobility application and these applications together. That's a good point. Yeah, if K minus one or mobile, then you can lose connectivity even if just one sensor just dies, uh, let's say, because of battery drainage. So it is the total degrees of freedom you might have, let's say, if that's something uh, you are familiar with. So number of uh, mobile nodes plus the number of nodes that you can afford to lose has to be K minus one, right? Any other questions? All right, thank you.